Never did I think I'd be sharing french fries and civic debate with Mary Beth Tinker one day when I learned about her in middle school, but that's exactly what we got to do. My name is Olivia Wisby. And I'm Shelby Houghton. We're both members of the Milford High School We the People team, and we had the unique opportunity to sit down with a Washington, D.C. lover, a man who runs his own radio show, and a passionate mama bear. You know them as Mary Beth Tinker, John Tinker, and Kathy Colmeyer Frey. We got to hear personal stories about things most students can only find in a textbook but our conversations didn't end there. We talked about the wild stories of past Supreme Court cases, if religion allows for businesses to refuse service to consumers, and the question, should 16-year-olds be allowed to vote for their school board members? One common theme linking our discussions together was evident after only a few moments. Passion. Passion for student rights, the importance of civil disobedience, and the First Amendment. Genuine interest for the rights of others and the protection those rights entail. It's truly inspiring to see passionate people fighting for student rights long after they have left the schoolhouse gate. Whether it's wearing an armband, writing an article to inform a school in need, or giving students the rights they deserve, the First Amendment is relevant regardless of time period. The main message we got today was just that, that our rights as students are evolving even today and is of the utmost importance to stand up for what you believe in. Mary Beth told us something today I think we could all do well to remember, that that is how history is made ordinary people like us doing small things. We'd encourage you to follow the New Hampshire Council for Social Studies on nhcss.org on Instagram and Facebook. And now we'd like to introduce you to John Greeby, who is a professor of law at UNH and will be your moderator for this evening. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, this should be a fantastic event, uh, selfishly, as somebody who teaches constitutional law and has taught the First Amendment. It's, it's such a thrill to be able to meet uh, the people involved in these, um, you know, these important First Amendment cases that we always teach when we teach First Amendment. Um, I'd like to start, though, by uh, acknowledging and thanking our sponsors, um, New Hampshire Humanities, the New Hampshire Council, Council for the Social Studies, uh, the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education, the New Hampshire Bar Fellows, the New Hampshire Historical Society, Frederick's uh, Pastries, and the James Madison Legacy Project. Um, thank you all very much for your support uh, of this event and generally for civics education. Um, I'd also like to thank the Audi, uh, which has been um, uh, a terrific partner in, in putting this together. Um, and finally, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Dave Alcox, uh, who is really the driving force behind this event, uh, Susan Leahy, who chairs our New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education, uh, Martha Madsen, uh, who's the president of that institute, um, and uh, everybody else who, who came together and, and, and prepared this. Um, at this point, I'd actually like to have our panelists come out and sit down, um, and uh, I will then uh, briefly introduce you to them, and we'll get started. Immediately to my right, uh, so to your left up here, is uh, Mary Beth Tinker. Um, Mary Beth Aunt Tinker and her brother John uh, were parties uh, in the famous case of Tinker versus Des Moines, which was decided by the United States Supreme Court uh, in 1969, um, but as is so often the case, um, began several years earlier. It takes a while for cases to get to the U.S. Supreme Court, um, but began in 1965 uh, with their decision to wear uh, armbands uh, in uh, school uh, to um, express their views about the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War. Um, uh, Mary Beth, right now, uh, it lives in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, is a, uh, a champion of civics education and free speech issues and does tinker tours uh, around the country. Um, and so it's just a thrill to have you here, Mary Beth. Uh, John uh, Tinker uh, is uh, an engineer at a radio station uh, that he and his wife started in Fayette, uh, Missouri. Um, to have you here, John. Um, to, to John's immediate right is Kathy Kohlmeyer Fry, I'm sorry, um, who uh, presently 
uh, works uh, for uh, Bass Pro Shops um, outside in a, in a uh, slightly outside of Springfield, Missouri. But Kathy um, was uh, one of the primary actors in another uh, important uh, landmark First Amendment case that went to the United States Supreme Court, uh, Hazelton versus Kohlmeyer. Uh, so her, her name is in the title of the case. Uh, this was a case involving uh, the rights of secondary school administrators uh, to regulate uh, what goes into at least certain uh, student newspapers. Um, and so we're thrilled to have you with us tonight Thank too you. also, Kathy. And then finally joining us uh, on the far end is David Hudson, who is a professor of law uh, at Vanderbilt University and also the Nashville School of Law. Um, David is a First Amendment expert and a law professor um, who serves as the First Amendment ombudsman for the Museums Institute, uh, I'm sorry, the Museum Institute's First Amendment Center. Uh, he contributes research and commentary, provides analysis and information to news media, is an author, a co-author, or an e a co editor of more than 40 books, uh, including Let the Students Speak, a history of the First Amendment, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, a history of the fight for free expression in American schools. Um, also works on the Encyclopedia of the First Amendment uh, and has published uh, numerous other books, book chapters, and articles. And David, it's a thrill to welcome you to Concord as well. Thank you. So um, I don't want to take any more time. I think uh, the format tonight is going to involve each of our speakers just uh, taking about 10 to 15 minutes to tell us a little bit about their experiences. Uh, I will then follow up with just a couple of questions and then we'll, we'll turn it loose for audience questions and answers as well. So, uh, Mary Beth, would you like to start us off? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, John, and thank you to everyone who put together this wonderful program, and to all of you for coming tonight. It's so good to be here with all of you. I've been traveling around the country. I'm actually a nurse, but I left the hospital a few years ago traveling around the country to speak to students and teachers and school members and community members about students and student voices in the first young people can use the First Amendment to really make a difference and to make a better world. I started familiar with that issue when I was just a middle school student. I was uh, 13 years old in eighth grade. And some of the, well, my father and my mother, this is really a family story because my parents raised us to be aware of what was going on and to stand up and speak up. My father was a Methodist minister, and then later we became involved with the Quakers. And so my parents believed in putting their faith into action. So I'd say my, our actions with wearing the black armbands uh, came directly out of uh, being raised in the church, really in the Methodist church, and then later with the Quakers. But um, that year, the Vietnam War was building up, and the year before, in 1964, in Mississippi, there had been a summer of civil rights activities to register African American voters. It was called Freedom Summer. And three civil rights workers had been murdered, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. So our parents went to Mississippi that year. And <clears throat> they I don't know how they did it, but. I mean, I didn't know what they were up against, that they were going to be facing the violence of the Ku Klux Klan and that their lives were in danger. I was over at the Taylors learning how to play croquet that summer. I was 11 years old, just about to turn 12. But at the end of the summer, the FBI found Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. Well, they found their bodies because sure enough, they had been murdered by the Ku Klux Klan. And on the very same day, it was August 4th, 1964, in those mighty times that are so much like today, again, these mighty times that we're living in now. On the very same day, August 4th, 1964, off of the coast of North Vietnam in the Gulf of, of Tonkin, a U.S. Navy ship claimed that it had been attacked. And it turns out that it had not been attacked. Um, it's pretty much uh, been decided, and I speak often with veterans, and it has been decided that they were not attacked. But it didn't stop the US Congress then from voting to escalate the Vietnam War and to start sending thousands of ground troops. Um, and so by that next Christmas of 1965, on the news we saw 
war, 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 the Vietnam War um, unfolding in all of its horrors. And we saw the children running from their burning huts, um, the soldiers on their body bags, and um, a newscaster named Walter Cronkite would give the daily body count. And so every day we were watching this and we were becoming sadder and sadder uh, about it. Some of the older kids at the high school heard about a plan and developed a plan to wear black armbands to school to mourn the dead in Vietnam on both sides of the war. And to support a Christmas truce that year that was being um, called for by um, Senator Robert Kennedy. And so I heard about it and I was very nervous. I didn't know if I should do it. I was a very shy girl and I kept going back and forth and I didn't know if I should do it or not. But um, in the end, I decided that I would wear the black armband to school. And um, that's where the trouble started because the principals made a rule against armbands two days before we were planning to wear them. And so that's how uh, December of 1965 turned out to be very different in our lives than, than what we had been planning on. Hmm. I bet. Well, thank you. John, would you like to? Um, I, I think I'd, I'd like to, first off, thank you very much for inviting us here. We're, we're really happy to be here. And um, thanks to Dave Alcox for putting this together and to the uh, NHCSS. Wonderful, great to have you all here. I, I wanted to try to fill in a little bit. People ask us, um, how did you get to be such that you would do this thing, the wear the armband? And, and uh, Mary Beth talked about our parents, and I just wanted to talk a little more about our parents. Um, in the 1950s, our father was a Methodist minister in a small town in Iowa. Uh, there was one one black family in a community of about 3,000 people. And they didn't let the kids, the black kids, swim in the swimming pool. So when our parents found out about this, they took it up with the city council. And uh, actually, I don't know what happened in the city council, but in the church, uh, the church board got upset with our father <clears throat> for bringing this controversy to their town. And so they asked him to leave. And so uh, we moved to Des Moines. And in Des Moines, uh, our mother felt that it was important that we have black friends. And so she investigated and made contacts in the black community and made friends among uh, black women. And, uh, and in particular, one of the families uh, had a bunch of kids and she introduced us all to those kids, and so now we had black friends. And in fact, uh, the boy that was my age, I'm still his friend, and we're still in contact um, 50 years later. But anyway, we invited these new friends to go to our new church in Des Moines, and the same kind of thing happened. The church didn't want to have black people in it. It was a Methodist church, um, they've all changed their mind by now. They, they, they felt that um, our father was ahead of his time, and I think he was in Iowa, but they also asked him to leave. And so at that point, uh, our father got a job offer from the American Friends Service Committee, which is a Quaker organization and very interested in racial justice and peace issues, and that, so that was a perfect job. Uh, our father became the peace education secretary for the Midwest uh, states, for nine states in the, in the Midwest. Uh, part of the things that they organized as their anti-war uh, effort was uh, they helped coordinate two charter buses to go from Iowa to Washington, D.C. for the first big demonstration against the war in 1965, uh, around the Thanksgiving time. I lobbied uh, my parents to be able to go on that trip, and they agreed to let me go. Uh, so it was an amazing experience for me, a 15-year-old kid, to be in Des Moines, uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., with tens of thousands of people protesting against the war. And I had been a minority, 
we had been minorities to oppose the war, and suddenly there we were surrounded by support. It was a wonderful feeling. On the bus road ride back, we had a discussion of how we could continue to protest the war and try to bring consciousness, awareness of the war to the public. And one of the people on the bus had heard that there was a plan to wear black armbands, and it was a national plan, and I can't tell you much more about it. But um, that's how the idea of black armbands came. And it, uh, the black armband was a traditional symbol of mourning. Uh, if someone in your family had died, you might wear a black strip of cloth on your sleeve just to let people know that this sad event happened. So that's how we got to black armbands. Uh, there were four high school students on that bus ride back, and we were coincidentally, all members of a Unitarian youth group. Uh, even though we attended the Quaker meeting, I also attended the Unitarian church, so I was double uh, religious in a sense. <laughs> anyway, um, the four of us took the, the armband idea to this youth group, and a, about a dozen people in the youth group decided all to wear armbands. And one of them uh, wrote an article for his school newspaper uh, explaining why we were wearing armbands, to mourn the deaths on both sides of the conflict and to promote Robert Kennedy's call for a Christmas truce. So when he took his article for the school newspaper to the principal, or to the student advisor, the advisor took it to the principal and the principal called the other principals in Des Moines on the phone and they got together and had a, a meeting in which they decided to ban the wearing of armbands. And as Mary Beth said, that happened just two days before our um, projected wearing of them. Uh, we found out about it from the newspaper, that the principals had decided not to allow it. I thought that we should, that the students in this new situation should, um, should have a discussion of how we were going to deal with this uh, now confrontation that was going to occur. Um, and I made last minute efforts to kind of call it off for that day, but I didn't get around to. Yeah, thanks. Mary Beth went to school early, and so, uh, and also Chris Eckhart. Chris Eckhart was the third plaintiff in, in our suit, and um, Chris, I called him on the phone, he said, I don't care, I'm going to wear it anyway. And he went off to school. So that first day, uh, Mary Beth and Chris got kicked out of school. We had a meeting at Chris's house that night and evening, and we tried to call the president of the school board, and he refused to talk to us. And so at that point, I decided to go ahead and wear the armband the next day. So that. Before we go on, what was the reaction of your fellow students at the time? Is it, would it be? Would you characterize it as, uh, you know, uh, welcoming and supportive, or was there a lot of hostility to? Most of the students at Harding Junior High School ignored me, and uh, my friend Connie, uh, she was saying, you should take off the arm bed. And then at lunch, some boys at the boys' table, they always sat next to us at the girls' table, <laughs> um, they started teasing me and saying, I want an arm band for Christmas, and, but, you know, really nothing too much happened to me over at the middle school. It's interesting because, in a way, the reaction from the adults was much stronger than the reaction from the students. Um, I wore the armband for half of a day. Uh, there was no comment at all, except from uh, my friends um, warned me. Uh, one of my teachers, I'm pretty sure, saw the armband but declined to make an issue out of it, which I thought was mature. Um, I went through the half, a half of a day, the morning, uh, like that, with no problem. My last class in, in the morning was gym, so when I got dressed after gym, uh, instead of putting on my dark suit coat with an armband over it, I just put my white shirt on with a, an armband, and it really showed up very well. <laughs> Yeah, John dressed up to be suspended from school. <laughs> he put on his best uh, jacket and... Was... So I went to the cafeteria for lunch and sat down and received uh, some harassment from fellow students. And then uh, a football player who I sort of knew, but not really, he came up and he, he, uh, he defended me. He said to the kids that were 
harassing me. He said, uh, look, you have your opinions about the war in Vietnam. John has his opinions about the war in Vietnam, and John has a right to his opinions, mm -hmm. so leave him alone. Yeah. And I thought that was just wonderful. And looking back, I think of it, we were brought up in the American public school system. And so the American ideals were what we were raised with and we believed in. And I think the kids really understood that better than the adults sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy. Thank you for having us. I really appreciate it. It's always nice to get to come and tell our stories to new faces and meet new people. So thank you for that. And thank you, Dave, especially. Um, in 1983, in the fall, I was in Journalism One, and I wanted to learn what it was like to be a journalist. And we had uh, our teacher, and later to become an advisor, was uh, Mr. Sturgis. And he was that teacher that hopefully um, everyone has had that you really thought the world of, that the, you know, they were your go-to person and you really believed in them. And he was that person for me. So in Journalism One, we're learning the Tinker Case. And that really stood out to me. And I apparently at the time didn't know what the future was going to hold and why that was so important to me. But it really struck home to me that um, the Tinkers were so brave and they stood up for something that they believed in there, and that impacted me. So thank you guys for making that difference in my life. But we also learned about um, prior restraint and what that meant to me was that basically um, as a journalist when I became one the next semester, because it only took a semester to learn how to be a journalist, um, that they couldn't censor me. So I thought, okay, cool, we can do some fun things, we can write and all is going to be okay. So we are now fast forward into second semester and I am the layout editor of the Hazelwood East Spectrum newspaper because I like to design and I like to make pretties. Mm -hmm. So we are deciding um, that typically our paper had been a lot of fluff, but we didn't want that. We wanted something that was more um, dimensional, something that was gonna reach out to more people um, and maybe make a difference to some. So we were looking through the school morgue, which is the dead story ideas or past stories, and we found these articles that had been previously run underneath the direction of a different principal and different advisor at that time. And they were on the topics of teen problems, which was pregnancy, divorce, marriage, runaways. Um, and that was a relevant issue in our school. In a school population that fluctuated anywhere from 2,000 to 2,500 people, we had about 30 to 40 girls at any given time that were pregnant. Um, we were a forward-moving school, basically, in Hazelwood. We had a daycare in the 80s because we had identified a large pregnancy population. Um, so we thought these stories were relevant, and we wanted to put a new spin on it and, and attempt to make a difference to our population. In the pregnancy articles, we interviewed three different girls that had three different um, takes on what it was like being pregnant. The first girl was, I got pregnant. I have to deal with this, it's my responsibility. The second girl was, yay, it's sunshine and rainbows, this is the coolest thing ever. And the third one was like, I really made a critical mistake in my life. Um, but trying to be the responsible journalist, because Sturgis had taught us to do so, we were working really hard to cover all of our bases. So we interviewed them, we had the permission of their parents. They signed consent prior to even starting the articles with us. Once we finished the articles, they took the articles back to the parents. The student signed off on it to make sure it was accurate. Parents signed off and said, yes, this is okay. It's okay, run this. So we covered our basis, so we thought. We also changed the names of those people. In the story about runaways, we included hotline numbers for people that were maybe considering making that choice because life was too, too much of a pressure at home. Um, hotline numbers to go and get help. And I think in, within that story, to me, that's the hardest of that one not running. Yes, we wanted all of them to run because we wanted to make a difference. Realizing though it wouldn't make a difference to every person, but if it reached out to one person and made a difference, ultimately that's our goal as a journalist is to touch people, reach out and form. Um, and with that story not running, during my high school years I worked at Target. I was a Targeteer. And, um, I went to high school with a fr friend named Reggie, and Reggie ran away. And during whatever reason, on his way out of wherever he was running to, he stopped in Target and took his life in the restroom of the Target bathroom. Um, and I think, you know, I'd like to think at least that had Reggie been able to actually see that story, read it, maybe he would have used that phone number that was in there, made a phone call, and maybe Reggie would still be here among us now. 
but we'll never know that. And I, I regret that, especially because of the principal not allowing us to run that story. Um, there were just a lot of things within there that provided statistics that wasn't out, stories to point fingers and say, you got pregnant, you made a bad choice, you know, you're, you've got bad parents because they divorced. It wasn't like that. It was just reaching out to people saying, we understand you're not the only one. And how many times have you guys felt like, you know, the problems in your life right now are the most relevant, you're the only one going through this? And it was meant to say, that's not the case, you're not alone. So we, we worked really hard at getting these published. Um, we were under the impression that they were going to go off and be published. Throughout the course of all of this, Mr. Sturgis left and they brought in an a interim advisor to help us. And he said it was his handling practice within his school to take the paper down to the principal for review. And when that happened, apparently they didn't trust us enough as a journalist um, that they pulled the stories and didn't tell us. They said that there were problems um, and they didn't run. So we come back to school and we're prepared to sell the paper thinking everything is gonna be great. We've worked really hard. We've got these great in-depth in articles and lo and behold, they're not there. So we took a vote um, because there were more, more seniors than juniors after we met with Mr. Reynolds, who was the principal that made that decision. Um, whether to sell the paper or not, and we, I didn't vote. I'm like, I, I don't want to be involved on it. Um, but the seniors ended up winning because there were more seniors, and the next article was devoted to the senior accolades for who's most likely to succeed or who's, you know, best looking kind of thing. Um, but we went down and we met with Mr. Reynolds, and he said, well, guys, we didn't run the stories because they're too mature for an immature audience. Now, I'm sort of outspoken. Um, those of you that have met me before maybe have picked up on that. But I said, um, I'm sorry, but if these are two mature art articles for an, an immature audience, then if you're old enough to get pregnant, shouldn't you be old enough to read about it? I, I didn't really score too many points with him. Um, but I think it made him think that, you know, maybe this kid knows something, maybe, you know, maybe there's truth to it. Um, but they didn't run, and we were disappointed in that, and at that point we decided that, you know, we needed to take more of a stand on it, and I snuck out of class because we had an open concept um, school, and our journalism class was on the third floor in the library, and that's where the phone was. So I snuck over into there, and I called Sturgis, and I said, here's what just happened, what do you think we should do? And he said, well, my suggestion would be to call the ACLU. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't know who they are, but sure, because I believed in them. <laughs> um, so we, I went back to the class and I'm like, Shh, you know, you whisper into all your friends because you didn't want the substitute teacher knowing what's going on because I was a good kid and I was afraid I was gonna get in trouble, but by gosh, I was mad. And so we got together and we went to the ACLU and they said, you absolutely have something going on. You guys have been wronged and we would like to help you. Um, so fast forward, they um, bring in Leslie Edwards as our attorney, and unfortunately Miss Edwards was not as prepared as what she believed she was, and I ultimately believe that she's the reason that we end up losing the case, because she didn't present key facts in it that the articles had previously run. We had um, gotten the consent because they said they, they knew who the people were. We changed the names, and you didn't know. Those of you that have seen the images that are out on Google, you can Google the case if you haven't seen it, but there is a mock-up of the um, actual layout of it. And within there, there is a ghosting of a pregnant girl. And when we went down and met with Reynolds, he said, well, I can identify that person. I said, well, great, out of all these girls that are pregnant at school, who is that? And he named someone, and I said, nope. I said, that's me. Obviously, I was not pregnant at that point. I was, didn't have my first child until I was 28, but do you know how easy it is to make yourself look pregnant for something like that? The secret is you take a shirt, you roll it up, put it under your shirt, and ta-da, it's immaculate conception, you're pregnant. <laughs> so he, again, wasn't happy that I you know, shot him down again, but I mean, you know, I was that, that kid. I wasn't the bad kid. I mean, I had a conversation with one student today and they're like, you know, I really expected you to like be this punk kid, and you're not. You're a, a normal person. I said, well, you know, I've grown up a little bit, but I still wasn't then. I was the kind of kid that was involved in honor society and marching band. I was that nerd, and I played soccer. 
Um, so I did the right things. I just happened to believe strongly in something that I had learned and was educated well in, um, that I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to share my experience and, and fight for what was right. And ultimately, the stories didn't run within the high school, but it really backfired on Mr. Reynolds because um, he was trying to really protect his community um, and not let the secret out that there were pregnant girls in Hazelwood, because that never happened, right? Um, but the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the St. Louis Globe Democrat ran them, and you guys, the size of St. Louis is considerable um, compared to just the small community of Hazelwood. So it reached that huge population and the secret was out. And that just didn't go well and it turned into a media storm from there and you know the story goes on and we lost. Um, Miss Edwards didn't even inform me that it was going to trial, didn't know it was happening. Um, so I didn't get to go to the US Supreme Court even though it's my name that was on this, which was kind of crushing and I learned of it the decision my uh, senior year of college, and I was sitting in my dorm room, remember it so very well, it was, it was January 13th of 88, and it was snowing like no end, and I get a phone call from a reporter in the Southeast Missouri and says, what's your opinion on losing the case? And I said, excuse me, say what? I have no comment. <laughs> um, so I hung up from that individual, and I proceeded to make a phone call Long distance charges did apply to me and I paid them because I wanted to hear firsthand from her what went on. So long story short, we lost, but today it's still relevant because there are, is an act that you guys can all become active in. It's called New Voices of USA. Um, New Hampshire is working diligently to become another, the 14th state hopefully to pass this, but essentially it's going to overturn the decision from the justices and give freedoms back to students, which ultimately is what we're all here for now. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, David, can you maybe take us through uh, the two cases a, a, a bit more from a legal perspective and then more generally, you know, give us a sense of the state of the law with respect to the, the First Amendment and in sec we'll, we'll start with secondary schools. Sure, I think uh, you know it's really an honor for me to be here. You could have anybody up here with these First Amendment heroines and heroes, and I just thank Dave Adcox as well for the for the opportunity. Uh, the Tinker case remains the seminal student speech case. It is the case for student public school student First Amendment rights, and it was not a foregone conclusion that the Tinkers would win their case. Um, they lost at the federal district court level before. Federal District Court Judge Roy Stevenson. They appealed to the 8th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, who I believe uh, gave a tie vote of 4-4. Four to four. So when, you, when it's a, a tie vote at an intermediate appellate court, the lower court uh, vote stands. So they are petitioners at the United States Supreme Court level. That's why it's listed Tinker versus Des Moines Independent Community School District. The decision on February 24th, 1969 was a resounding victory for student First Amendment rights. Justice Abe Fortas declared it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. That's why your programs read inside the schoolhouse gate tonight. The Supreme Court set up a very speech protective standard for public school students. They said schools are not enclaves of totalitarianism. That students are not closed circuit recipients of only that information in which school officials can impart. And it set up a fairly, as I said, a fairly speech protective standard that school officials can punish student speech or censure student speech only when they can show that that student speech causes a substantial disruption or material interference with school activities or invades the rights of others. They furthermore said that the Tinker case was a form of passive political speech. And they established another fundamental First Amendment principle in that case. That generally government officials may not silence a particular type of speech. In the case, as Mary Beth said, they banned the black armbands just as they learned that there might be a black armband protest. Meanwhile, they allowed students to wear political campaign buttons and even iron crosses. 
school, school officials selectively targeted a specific political symbol associated with a specific political viewpoint. That's what's known in First Amendment circles as viewpoint discrimination. And that's anathema to a free society and anathema to the First Amendment. The speech protective standard of Tinker led to a lot of uh, student litigation. It led to the striking down of a lot of repressive and authoritarian school rules. It gave students a voice. Now, it wasn't a unanimous decision. I believe it was seven to two. Justices Hugo Black and uh, John Harlan dissented. And I think Justice Black wrote that it was going to usher in this revolutionary era of permissiveness. Um, but I remember talking to John years after the case, and he said, well, thank goodness it ushered in a revolutionary era of permissiveness. I mean, students are people. They should have a voice. That's what Mary Beth has devoted her life to, is giving students voice. And so they should be applauded nearly 50 years. I think it's in 2019 will be the 50th year anniversary of her case. It remains good law. It remains the seminal student speech case. Unfortunately, uh, the Supreme Court in 1969 was much more protective of student rights than the United States Supreme Court in the 1980s. And in 1986, in a case called Bethel School District versus Frazier, the Supreme Court created a new rule, the first of what are sometimes called tinker carve-outs. They said that students' rights to engage in controversial expression must be balanced against society's countervailing interest in teaching students the boundaries of socially appropriate behavior. And they created a new rule that said public school officials could prohibit any student speech that they thought was vulgar, lewd, or plainly offensive. You think, okay, well, profanity, public school students should be able to prohibit profane speech. But the idea that a public school official can prohibit anything that is offensive or plainly offensive, that's a very vague concept that leads to a lot of censorship. It, it leads to this sort of eye of the beholder phenomenon, right? What's pleasing to one may be offensive to another. A couple of years later, the US Supreme Court decided the aforementioned Hazelwood case, Hazelwood School District versus Kuhlmeyer, January 13, 1988. The court created a new standard. Because Kathy would have won her case if they'd applied the Tinker standard. There's no way school officials could have showed that those student articles were substantially disruptive. They didn't invade the rights of other people. It actually would have done a lot of public good to bring attention to these issues that she was writing about, that she was editing. But the new rule that five members of the US Supreme Court came up with was something to the effect, educators do not offend the First Amendment by exercising editorial control over the style and content of school-sponsored expressive activities so long as their reasons for doing so are reasonably related to legitimate, reasonable pedagogical concerns. Reasonably related to legitimate educational concerns is the standard. Which the five members of the U.S. Supreme Court and the majority is a 5-3 decision decided in a breathtakingly broad way. A legitimate educational reason, according to the Supreme Court majority, was disassociating the school on matters of political controversy other than pure neutrality. That turns the First Amendment on its head. The essence of the First Amendment is the ability to criticize government officials, to speak your mind. Now that reasonably related to legitimate uh, pedagogical concerns, where did that standard come from? Can it come from? It came from a case, I think, a year earlier called uh, Turner versus Safley, involving a prison inmate named Leonard Safley who wanted to mail, who wanted to marry a female inmate and send her love letters. Problem, Missouri Department of Corrections had rules that prohibited inmates from marrying each other and from sending letters from one inmate in one penal institution to an inmate in another penal institution. Why am I mentioning this? Because in that case, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote, prison officials do not impinge on the constitutional rights of inmates so long as their reasons for doing so are reasonably related to legitimate penological concerns. 
So the standard for prisoner speech is reasonably related to legitimate penological concerns. The standard for school-sponsored student speech is reasonably related to legitimate pedagogical concerns. Ergo, students have the same level of free speech rights as prisoners. They substituted the word pedagogical for penological. That's not the model that we base uh, uh, learning and teaching and, and, and flourishing in a constitutional democracy. Kathy talked about the 13 or so states that have passed laws that provide greater, greater statutory protection. In other words, in some of these states, you have greater rights under a statute than you do under the First Amendment. And the reason for that is five members of the U.S. Supreme Court engaged in what Justice William Brennan wrote was brutal censorship. She was the victim of brutal censorship. Now, what do those states do? There's the, they've sometimes been referred to as anti-Hazelwood statutes. What most of those statutes do is by statute, they incorporate the Tinker Standard, the standard that we ought to have. Now, the professor asked me the state of student speech today. Unfortunately, what some courts have done is they have taken what Justice A. Fortas in the Tinker opinion designed to be a very student speech protective standard, and they've turned that substantial and material disruption standard into this totality of the circumstances equation that allows school officials to censor speech that ought to be protected. So I think it's vital that Mary Beth, John, and Kathy speak out about First Amendment rights, and it's vital that all of us speak out about First Amendment rights because students don't have enough First Amendment rights, and they're the future of our country. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, thanks to all of you. Um, this is not just a historical conversation, right? Um, I mean, we are living in a time right now uh, where there is a lot of attention on speech rights. Um, we are living in a time where there's a great deal of attention that's been paid uh, to uh, the decision made first by one NFL player and now a bunch of other NFL players um, uh, to take a knee during the national anthem. And we've had comments on that from some of the very highest officials uh, in, our, in our system of government. Uh, and correspondingly, we're also seeing uh, lots of calls for um, public universities, uh, in particular, uh, to be um, more selective uh, in terms of uh, who they invite to speak. Um, uh, sadly, we've seen an uptick in speech that you know, many would describe as hateful or, or hate speech. Um, and there have been, there have been calls for, for greater regulation. Um, and so this First Amendment, and, and the NFL, of course, is not, doesn't raise a pure First Amendment right because the NFL isn't, isn't government, but we have, again, government officials um, taking strong views on, on the extent to which it, you know, expressive conduct should be allowed. And so I just wanted to th put both of those um, uh, contexts out there and, and ask if anyone would like to comment. Um, in light of your experiences, um, have you come to develop strong views about the extent to which uh, uh, speech ought to be allowed, even speech that uh, many, many people would regard as, as terribly offensive and degrading? Well, there is no legal definition of hate speech, so it's kind of a nebulous area, right, David? Uh, but I tend to lean towards, uh, against censorship, and to believe that people should be able to say things that uh, others make. And I mean, when we wore our black armbands, that was considered offensive by a lot of people. It was considered unpatriotic. It was considered disrespectful to the military. And of course, we didn't mean it to be disrespectful. We were. Uh, you know, expressing our views for peace. So I tend to be a First Amendment advocate and to think that uh, universities should not shut down controversial speech and that students should be allowed. Besides the NFL, there are a number of students around the country who are also taking a knee 
in the public schools. I know there's a case in Texas, there's one I, uh, in Michigan where a sixth grader was pulled out of his chair for not saying the Pledge of Allegiance, which is clearly unconstitutional because of the Barnett case in 1943, where the Supreme Court ruled that public school students do not have to say the Pledge of Allegiance. It's crystal clear. Um, so I tend to lean towards freedom of speech and against censorship myself. I, I see uh, a, ma a major conflict <clears throat> between human nature, which is hundreds of thousands of years old, and our democratic constitutional idea of how a society should be run. And I, I think, and this is my personal view, and I'm not a psychologist or an anthropologist or anything like that, but I think that uh, the human species has a real tendency to um, form majorities that suppress minorities, and that that is just who we are, down deep. And I think that the, the constitutional form of government is an attempt to rise above that and to form something that's bigger and better than that kind of law of the jungle approach. But I think that we're always sort of on the edge and that uh, the constant vigilance is necessary and that it's, a, it's not intuitive <coughs> for us as creatures to understand the need for protecting dissident speech. And, and I think looking at the uh, Kaepernick uh, situation and all that's followed from that, that we can see there's been an effort to misunderstand what he was doing and to frame it as a disrespectful act toward the national symbol instead of a very respectful act to gain attention to the police brutality against black young men, especially. That's a very prevalent, very current problem. And that uh, my view is that Kaepernick was uh, doing a very dignified thing to bring attention to that. But I want to point out that the, the um, intentional misunderstanding of that by certain of the media and, and that's the kind of problem I think we're up against as a society. How can we keep true to our intellectual ideas of what will form a free society? And in our case, the Constitution of the United States and its amendments and the case law and all of that. But anyway, that's, what I think, that's where I think we are right now. Obviously, I'm in favor of free speech and not censorship. Um, but as far as where I see this thing right now with all of the football, I'm not a football girl, so I'm not going to pretend to be. Um, but I see it more right now as a relationship between employer and employee where he's got a bigger platform than most of us have to be able to express his opinions. And at what point does the employer have rights to say you're misrepresenting what the agency or organization feels or believes. So I think um, along those lines, I think that he has, has to respect some of what his employer wishes as well, whether he feels strongly not being censored or not. Um, how important is your job to you? Ultimately should be one of his questions, which I think right now is kind of in danger of, and no one wants him from what I understand. I think, you know, the NFL is a, is a private entity, it's not the government, you know, and we do have to keep in mind that the First Amendment limits government censorship, not, not private censorship. So technically the NFL can pass rules and regulations if they're passed pursuant to the collective bargaining process that would limit speech rights of players that play on teams. Um, I also agree with Mary Beth that if that occurs in a public school, that the student may uh, has a has a very good precedent to rely on, and that is the aforementioned West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, was decided on Flag Day, June 14, 1943. Um, it's a it's a beautiful opinion, 
And, it's, and it, there's a line in there from Justice Robert Jackson I love. It says, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, is that no official higher petty shall prescribe what should be orthodox in matters of politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of public opinion. And the freedom to differ is freedom. So while I, I can sympathize with, with what he did, um, I do recognize the right of the private entity to, uh, to, to, to pass rules to regulate it. On the question of hate speech, um, we are somewhat of a free speech outlier in the world. The rule, at least for adults in free society, is hate speech is protected unless it incites imminent lawless action, it rises to the level of a true threat or harassment, or it constitutes so-called fighting words. And that does distinguish us from, uh, from a lot of other countries around the globe. I do believe strongly in what is uh, one of the fundamental precepts of the First Amendment. It's called the counter-speech doctrine. When we are confronted with harmful, obnoxious, or repugnant speech, our initial impulse shouldn't be to shut it down. It should be to counter it with positive speech. And that principle tra is traced back to Justice Louis Brandeis's concurring opinion in Whitney versus California in 1927. I love these words. He said, quote, if there be time to expose through discussion the falsehood and fallacies, to avert the evils by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. Too many of us support free speech in theory, but not in reality. Uh, it's what uh, the late Nat Hentoff described it as free speech for me, but not for thee. Or dissonance between the First Amendment ideal and the First Amendment real. Because it's difficult sometimes to accept speech with which we dislike or vehemently hate. But that's what Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said, freedom for the thought that we hate. <clears throat> right? In a free society, we have to accept that there's going to be a lot of speech that we don't like. I'm looking at the time, and I think it's appropriate now to, um, I, I can't see out there very well, but um, to, to open the floor to questions. And I understand that we have some students who are, um, are we going to have microphones brought to people asking questions? Is that right? Or otherwise we can just repeat questions. We can, if not. I know that'll help for the recording at least. So. Thank you. There's a question right here in the third row, it looks like. Again, thank you so much. This is just terrific. I'm having a little fangirl moment here, just <laughs> being in your presence. Um, I, I did want to hear more about the India Landry case, which is the Texas case of the young woman um, who has been suspended for not saying the Pledge of Allegiance, and if you had any more thoughts, um, does, does she need a, a, Mr., um, a Mr. Spiegel? What was, the, what was your, um, Sturgis, thank you. D does she need a Mr. Sturgis to, uh, to call and say, get the ACLU? <laughs> yeah, the case in Texas, uh, I think it's at Klein, Klein High School, I believe. Um, the girl was put out of school, but she's now suing the school. And I think there's another district, and I'm not sure where that that is also happening. That Louisiana, the school maybe? was it Louisiana, yeah, where the principal, principal was... wrote the letter and saying that the students should be put out of school. Um, so yeah, that's a losing argument. I mean, the school district doesn't have a leg to stand on there. But the problem is that, and I was just talking. I mean, I speak to a lot of school attorneys and, and the school board organizations, but the problem is that some of the school board members would rather be re-elected to the school board than follow the Constitution. <coughs> so they, some of them may know well that it's against the Constitution, but the popularity of it, it's like John said, the majority, the, the will of the majority to you know, salute the flag can override sometimes the actual constitutional law. So. I think it's important for people that care about the law and really respect our Constitution to take a stand and speak up about that. You've probably heard about those cases too. What do you think about those? And also there's a couple cases where the 
uh, referee walked off the court to um, protest the protester at a couple of high schools. And so the referees have been disciplined. Um, one of them was just put off the uh, list of referees for a year and a half as punishment for walking off the court because he was upset that I think a girl was taking a knee during a um, soccer game, I think. Yeah. Uh, the, the school may try to argue that there, um, at least when it happens as part of an extracurricular activity that the student doesn't have as much right to be a member of say the football team or the cheerleading squad as they do to actually be in school because we have compulsory education laws. But I agree with Mary Beth. I think the Barnett principle controls and I think these students are on very strong legal ground. I think they have a good case. There's two questions. Uh, so I see. There's a gentleman on the aisle. Maybe he could go and then just in the row behind him. Uh, uh, what about any uh, attempts to sort of subvert some of the, the barriers that the court has put in place for newspapers by making them limited public forums? If I distribute my paper outside the school, if I have a web presence that allows the public to, to send out comments, does that help me in any way? Could you, could you talk about the public yeah, forum doctrine yeah, a little? Yeah, that's a great that, question because yeah. in the Hazelwood case itself, there was a, a, a threshold issue that the court had to decide, and that was had, had the school, by creating this uh, newspaper, was it called the Spectrum? But had they created a public forum, in other words, had they opened it up by policy and practice, to where there really wasn't a policy and practice of school censorship or school control over the newspaper. So the initial question in a lot of these cases is, is this student newspaper a public forum? If it's a public forum, then there are essentially enhanced First Amendment rights and the school doesn't have as strong a leg to stand on when it tries to censor the newspaper. Now what a lot of school board attorneys have done is they've made sure that there's language that's drafted to make sure that the school-sponsored newspaper is not a public forum. And so they specifically reserve in the bylaws provisions that say it's not a public forum. It's not a public forum and there's not one of those special laws in, in those 13 states that have those laws that Kathy referred to. Then the Hazelwood standard applies and the Hazelwood standard is, I think we can all agree, a very deferential standard for school officials, and school officials usually prevail when the Hazelwood standard is used. As opposed to when the Tinker standard is used, then the, the students have a fighting chance because it's a much more speech protective standard. Uh, I do think that there are, that, that school advisors and students should advocate to try to get their paper to be a public forum. Whether that's going to be successful or not often depends upon the school board and the, who are the leaders of the specific school. So, well, you know, I, I, I applaud the efforts to try to create that environment where there is greater protection for free speech. Thank you. And there was, a, well, yes. <laughs> Stand. Hi. Oh, thank you for, for uh, fielding my question for being here. This is all very um, helpful. Um, I'm, I want to ask the question to whether, uh, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but whether um, the, the legal rules are prepared to deal with um, today's modern communications and, and social media, because um, if we're going to argue that um, we should limit speech because I'm feeling harassed or because somebody's um, hateful speech is um, is impinging on my own rights. Um, are those standards maybe outdated because today we're just getting a tsunami of communication and information? Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, people feel a little bit more overwhelmed. And I could totally see how, uh, from any viewpoint, if you're of the minority, how you may feel even more. <laughs> I think you get what I'm trying to get at, but. Yeah, yeah so, um, and, and, and just sort of amplifying what you're saying too, um, 
the, our Constitution um, also protects the notion of equality. You know, when, so when you make a uh, mention of uh, the rights of minorities, um, sometimes mm -hmm. the free speech right can be seen to be coming into conflict with the right of equality, especially when the speech in question um, is speech advocating for inequality or, or worse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any thoughts on, on social media and the, you know, the, the, this brave new world that we've entered? Well, the lady might not be a lawyer, but she asked the number one pressing question in student speech law. And that's how far does the arm of school authority extend to off-campus online student speech? <clears throat> Five different cases that I know of have been appealed to the United States Supreme Court asking that question. And so far, the US Supreme Court has assiduously avoided the question. Most courts have said that, that have looked at it, have said that school officials can regulate off-campus online speech as long as they can show, one, that there's a reasonable nexus or connection between the off-campus online speech and something that happens at school, and then they apply the tinker standard of the substantial and material disruption. She asked a question about impinging the rights of others. That's often the, what's referred to sometimes as the forgotten part of the Tinker case. When does some student speech invade or impinge on the rights of other students? The response that we have now uh, is the passing of cyberbullying laws, right? Every school district, or about every school district in some states have laws that prohibit bullying in schools. Mm -hmm. And they've amended those laws to prohibit cyberbullying. So the question that we have in the First Amendment community often is whether the cyberbullying laws are drafted with enough precision, are they precise enough to survive constitutional review? Because some of the initial efforts, they were, they were way too broad and too vague. But, that, but that, the, the issue you're asking is, is a great one because it's an unsettled area. We essentially have different standards that different lower courts are applying with regard to the regulation of, of student social media speech. And we need the United States Supreme Court to provide us with an answer. They need to take one of these cases and, and decide it. But it does seem that the schoolhouse gate has been obliterated. That basically if a student has speech outside of school that can be linked to substantial disruption or some kind of impinging on the rights of others in school that they do not, they're not protected anymore. Is that right? That, that, that unfortunately is the case. And sometimes, you know, sometimes the off-campus online speech is really, really harmful and it does, it, it does cause a substantial disruption, but a lot of times it appears to be just a fear of new technology and sort of a, a overreaction sometimes on the part of school officials. Now there's, there's another phenomenon that's occurred in some school districts, which I think is also problematic, and that is some school officials won't discipline students for any off-campus speech because they're not sure if they have authority. So what happens when some students get on the internet and they defame some of their teachers? There have been a few cases where teachers have actually sued their students in court for defamation, right? Because we do, we all have the right to sue somebody else for defamation if somebody posts a false statement of fact about us that harms our reputation. Um, and that's what I think we do need to educate with rights come responsibilities. The internet and social media is not a legal free zone. I mean, we've even had uh, some students get in real trouble for some of the pictures that they're sending on their phones. Right? Um, so there needs to be a lot of education. Um, there needs to be, I think, we need to keep in mind the, the protection of, of people and protecting people from harassment, but we do need to keep, we need, we need to hold lawmakers accountable when they draft laws that are simply too broad and too vague.
Yeah, let's just say the president. For, for example, for example. <laughs> Is it when he suggests that they get fired, or is it when he demands that they get fired, or is it when he pressures owners to take action? Is there like a line that he can cross um, that means that the government is suppressing these free speech for these, for these people? The, the two cases that, that I think are most relevant with, with uh, the president and the First Amendment, there, there's a case in Kentucky where at one of the rallies when he was a candidate, he allegedly, the allegation is that he engaged in speech that caused some um, people to beat up another person in the crowd. And so the question is whether the president's speech incited imminent lawless action. Um, and that's in a federal district court in Kentucky. There's another case that was filed in a federal district court in New York, and that involves the uh, Trump's Twitter feed, where he has, I think, 30 or 40 million followers, but, or I forget the exact number, but he deletes people that criticize him too much. And so there's been a First Amendment lawsuit filed by the Knight Institute at Columbia University saying mm. that he's actually engaged in impermissible viewpoint discrimination by uh, essentially censoring people who disagree with him or he doesn't like. Now on the question of when he just makes comments about certain controversies, um, I'm not sure that that rises to the level of official compulsion. I think that's where your question is getting to. Um, I, I don't think that, because he speaks out on a lot of stuff. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the concept of rhetorical hyperbole has taken on a whole new meaning um, with, with this president. So, you know, I, I, I haven't seen anything yet where I, could, where, I, where I could see a player challenge Trump personally. Maybe there's something I'm not aware of, but I, I just don't see that yet. I just have a, I just, uh, have a question about the uh, state of the law with regard to school boards suppressing certain books that might be in school libraries. I, I read somewhere that, for, for example, To Kill a Mockingbird has been removed from uh, some southern schools, things of that sort. Is there any case law or any law development to uh, deal with some boundaries about what school boards can do in that regard? Yeah, the, the seminal case on that is Board of Education versus PICO, 1982. Unfortunately, it's a highly fractured decision. But you had a, a middle school and a high school, they removed nine books from high school library shelves. Um, and essentially they removed them because they said they had unsuitable ideas. Um, and they removed authors like Eldridge Cleaver, Kurt Vonnegut, Alice Walker, you know, very prominent books. And what Justice Brennan said in his plurality opinion at the U.S. Supreme Court is that public school officials violate the First Amendment when they remove books from library shelves simply because the ideas are unsuitable. Right, so in other words, you can't censor the book because you don't like the ideas. Um, with regard to removing books, the same principle should apply, I think, from removing books from, uh, from school curriculum. Um, so I, you know, the, the American Library Association has a banned books week every year. And to remove To Kill a Mockingbird, I think, is absurd. Uh, I just think it's absurd to remove that book. Uh, that's a valuable book. Uh, it, 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 you have to sometimes understand that books were written at certain times and the underlying theme of Harper Lee in that book is against racism. Um, so when I read that story, I also, I think I had the same reaction as you did. I, I thought that was bad. Like bad to censor that book. And um, that's why we need to speak out about it in the First Amendment community. I, just to reiterate something also that David said earlier is e even in contexts where school officials at, you know, are empowered with the greatest amount of discretion, so non-public forums, uh, there still is the principle that, um, that they cannot engage in viewpoint discrimination. Uh, that, is, it, that is not allowed in any context. Um, 
And uh, so I would think that there's, there might possibly be room for argument, um, uh, even if you situate it in, you know, the, the, the Kohlmeier regime is, is very, very friendly uh, to exercise of discretion, right, by, by school officials. Um, but um, if, you can, if you can plausibly show viewpoint discrimination, that becomes constitutionally problematic. So there are hands over here too, I saw. Yes, over on the, on the far aisle over there. Uh, going off your previous answer during the night, how do you propose that schools deal with the social media infractions off campus? Because isn't, out of, isn't it out of the school's um, jurisdiction at that point, as a specific example using Snapchat? How should schools deal with social media problems off of camp, off campus? Yes. Is your question? I mean, personally, I think that students should have a lot more say in your schools, and that students should have a part in deciding how to handle those issues and every issue that takes place in your school. So I don't know that I'd be the one to say how it should be handled. I would like to ask how you think it should be handled. Are you in high school, by the way? Uh, yes, I'm a sophomore at Kearsarge. Okay. okay, so what do you think? Should there be limits? Should there be, should you have a say in these things? Uh, uh, I just meant more when you said specifically that schools do have the jurisdiction off campus to um, regulate social media use, and so I just wondered how you could do that if it was specifically off campus. Yeah, the courts, the courts have pretty much been ruling, especially recently, that off campus speech is not necessarily protected speech. I, I think what you've got to be able to show, right, you've got to be able to show a connection. They, the school officials have to be able to show that it's not just a student voicing their opinion about something, that there has to be a discernible connection between that off-campus speech and something that happens at school. Um, so like if the, 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 there was one case out of the Fourth Circuit, the Kowalski case, where the student got on there and was just really flagrant bullying. And so like uh, several uh, students were bullying this one girl and then some yeah. of that, the, the verbal bullying on the internet surfaced in actual bullying <clears throat> in the school. It's hard to argue there's not a nexus or connection between that off-campus expression and then what happened on the school ground. So there, I think the school board or the school officials would be on, uh, be on stronger ground to regulate that. I mean, lately there has been uh, more racist speech uh, among students, and some of it is online or off, uh, um, on social media. And I really think that students should join together and figure out how to deal with it, how to prevent racism in the schools. There's a school in Maryland where I was just speaking, and they've started a racial dialogue club that meets once a week at lunchtime. And it's really great. And you know, a couple of hundred kids were there, and they come every week, and they're doing all kinds of things with t-shirts and you know, trying to deal with the speech um, that they didn't like that was going on off online. So I just think students should have some say about how to solve it. There's a great line by a judge I know, Judge Rodney Sipple. And he wrote, a, he wrote a, on a case that is one of the very first internet student censorship cases in 1998. And you'll love this. You may have heard of this. He goes, disliking student speech is not an acceptable justification for limited it under tinker. <laughs> <laughs> Just first, I want to thank you for uh, fighting the fight. But um, so I have a two-part question. What do you think the biggest misperception about each of your cases um, is? And knowing what you know now, would you have done something differently back then? I know that the Tinkers won their case, but John, would you have worn your arbor in the first day? Or is there something you guys would have done different, get more kids involved? And Kathy, what would you have done uh, differently? I think the only thing I would have done differently is maybe um, worked harder to find a better attorney to represent us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someone that wasn't out to just really make a name for herself, and I think really that's what her intent was. She was new practicing, um, and they offer basically like a mock trial before you go to the Supreme Court, and she didn't believe she needed to do so. Um, and she was very just, to listen to the, the case on Oya's, 
Um, she was just very ill-spoken, did very uneducated, um, didn't bring out the key facts of it. So I think she she just she blew it. I mean, in the short of it, um, she lost her practice. She became ill and passed away. So sorry. <laughs> Are there hands? I'm worried I'm not seeing hands in the I, back. I just, I just say, ahead, I, I get asked that question. If, if the question, if I heard it right, is would you have done something differently? Or When I look back, I'm so pleased with how things came out that I just don't even want to breathe around. <laughs> <laughs> People say, well, you, you, wore, you didn't wear the armband the first day. Okay, so I, I look like I'm lagging a little bit. Okay, uh. but who knows? That might have been a positive mm -hmm. feature somewhere along the line in, in, uh, in the argument. I, 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 I don't have any regrets over the way the case went. I have regrets about other things in my life, of course. We, we all should, I think, uh, being human. But about the case, I, I, I'm very happy with the way everything went. I, would, I guess to add to that, for me, I, I feel bad at the students and how hard it made for students to um, publish their views and how hard it's made things for the advisors to be able to fairly support their students so because that was never our intent obviously you know when we started this who would have thought that you know I would be considered a icon of freedom I think is what they called us in New York <laughs> and I'm just a small Missouri girl <laughs> Um, but I just happen to feel strongly about my rights and, and that, that mattered to me. But I think it very much formed who I am today that I'm not real shy. Um, and I have definitely formulated my kids to also be the same and to stand up for their beliefs. Um, ironically, my son was censored a couple years ago. And man, you talk about a knife to the heart, witnessing your kid go through that. And I'm thinking, what are the chances, really? So, you know, just, I wanted to make a difference, and that's all. That, but I think in the long run, I think that I've been able to tell my story, and I think that hopefully has made a difference to, you know, some people across the country that I can share that and hopefully inspire others to stand up for what they believe in. I think we have a couple more minutes, and I, I want to make sure anyone in the back who has a question has an opportunity to. Hi, um, I had a question about uh, student autonomy. Um, Mary Beth, you were 13 when uh, you brought the armband to the school. Um, I teach eighth grade, so I'm very familiar with, especially this past election year, students bringing opinions in the school. Um, I don't know, is there a case law or uh, what your opinions are of when do the, um, the autonomous feelings of a, a child's free speech um, and the um, imposition of their parents, you both reference mm -hmm. your parents as being a great influence, um, where do those lines cross and is that something we should be concerned about? Yeah, our parents were a huge influence on us and people always said, well, the, uh, a lot of adults wanted to make it out that our parents made us wear the armbands or told us to wear the armbands, and that wasn't true at all. Our father didn't, was really, he didn't really want us to wear the armbands at first, but then we explained that it was our conscience and that brought him over to our side because he had a weakness for the conscience, <laughs> having been through World, World War II and, see, and seen some of his friends die, and he really believed that people should stand up for their conscience or else we, would have the, we could have the Nazis again. So, um, you know, people would always make it out like our parents had made us do this or it was just your parents, blah, blah. Because people have a hard time, I think, uh, realizing sometimes, and working as a nurse, I've worked mostly with children. Children do have a lot of feelings and a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts about what's going on in the world. And young people, I know a lot of you here are aware of what's going on. And yes, we were influenced by our parents, but it wasn't that our parents, you know, made us put on the armband. And, and even in court, the school board lawyers would say, well, you know, who bought the material? And did your parents pin it on you? And after a while, we wanted to just say, our parents didn't have to pin it on us. It was already in our hearts. They had already influenced us, and they had already been our examples. 
for peace and for standing up for the things that you believe in. It was much deeper than, than that already by the time we wore the armies. Did you want to answer? No, I just say, my, our father was not convinced that we were doing the right thing. Uh, he, he was very against the war, but he also was a believer in authority in the abstract and that society depends on authority and it depends on respect for authority. And so he, like for me, he said, John, I'm not so sure you should wear that. When, when I was going out the door, I said, it's just a piece of cloth. People are dying in Vietnam. He said, well, then it, it's a matter of conscience for you. I said, yes, I guess it is. He said, well, then I support you. And it, it, he was engaging in the struggle that we really have to engage in, in dealing with boundary types of issues, what's right or wrong. And he was engaging in it, and he taught us to engage in it. So. Both of these cases were children's rights cases and teenagers' rights cases. It's an international issue of human rights because you had uh, 16, 17 year old boys who were, could have been shipped off to Vietnam who were being told they couldn't even wear a little piece of black cloth on their arm to say how they felt about that war. And they certainly wouldn't uh, be able to vote at age 18. In Kathy's case, you had students who were getting pregnant, who were dealing with suicidal thoughts, and who were, his parents were getting divorced, who were being told that they could not write about that, and they could not read about that. So it's an international issue. I mean, these, these, uh, these are all cases, all to, both of these cases have to do with children's rights and teenagers' rights. My sense is that we could go and Go. Oh, is there, okay, one more. Yes, Quick. Could I do one more? Yeah. Um, in the last year, Rhode Island and Vermont have passed new voices legislation. I think, uh, Mary Beth, you have been working with the Student Press Law Center and newvoices.org, and I get the sense, Kathy, that you're alluding to some progress towards this in New Hampshire. Um, what do New Hampshire high school students and college students need to do? What part can they play in passing new voices legislation in the live free or die state? What we're doing in Missouri is writing letters to our representatives, to our senators, and expressing our opinions on it. Um, just get the word out, talk among yourselves, but contact these people. They're the ones that are going to the, to the representatives and the senators hoping to get these things accomplished. So if you can really draft a good, solid letter, um, send it, a and express your opinions on it, and hopefully it's in favor of it and not against. We're really in the beginning stages in New Hampshire and also New York and New Jersey are going to be um, you know, focuses of this, this year. So we're just putting things together. And if any of you are interested, it's really exciting. And the way that we won in the other states was by having students testify and really lead the charge. So if any of you are interested in being involved with this, write to me at marybethtinker at gmail, and Kathy and I can, um, you know, we can work on, on uh, doing this in New Hampshire also. It's really exciting, and it's a good thing to protect student journalists. A lot of times, well, first of all, we know the free press is under attack, so we have to stand up for the free press, but a lot of people are getting their news from student journalists. And so it's more important than ever for student journalists to, to have rights. So yes, write to us, Mary Beth Tinker at Gmail, or the Student Press Law Center. You can go there and look up the new voices, um, states, and what's going on. There's Facebook pages. I think most of the states are getting on board with having those um, pages. But you can follow the activity through that, and then also through your state website as far as what when things are going to be heard. Um, but by partnering with your rep local representatives and getting involved by each community, um, they can give you more direction as far as when things are going to be presented. Um, and go sit in on it, go ask to speak, to give your input on it, but it, it makes a huge difference. Um, slowly Missouri is gaining speed, we're at it again, but we're a little, a little bit backwards there. But um, it, it, it makes a difference, and we're, we will eventually accomplish in Missouri. I am just wholeheartedly in favor of believing that. 
It helps that the major journalism organizations have backed it, like the Journalism Education Association has said that Hazelwood is not good journalism education and the Society of Professional Journalists, and so we have a lot of support from professional journalists and journalism educators. Could you say what it is? It's called New Voices, and um, it's an effort in various states around the country to pass legislation that is protective of student journalist rights. The, the American Bar Association has supported the ABA House of Delegates in August, I think it was, supported your campaign, the New Voices campaign. So that, that may help as well. Well, I'm sorry, I've, I've been told that we have to finish up uh, now, but uh, this has been really wonderful. And I'd like to thank our guests, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Thank you. 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 Th